Welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Victoria here on the west coast of Canada on Vancouver Island. I hope everybody is having a fantastic week. Welcome Carolina, our chat moderator. Hi Cass, welcome members. Shahil, Pooja, good to see many students in this class. Uh, students, this is an IELTS listening class. We are looking at parts three and part four. Uh, these parts will be about art and roads, as you might remember from uh, last week's uh, listening part one and part two class. Uh, students, this is a subscriber chat class. So uh, if you'd like to join the chat, then subscribe to our uh, channel. We want to really encourage a lot of people to subscribe because you will get tons of help. Most of it is absolutely free. Uh, so it's a good time to subscribe to our channel. Subscribe now and join this chat. Students, uh, this lesson is presented to you by aehelp.com. We are using the IELTS practice exams from these websites as well as gieltshelp.com for general IELTS where you can find original exams, lesson videos, and an interactive course that you can also get on your phone, Academic IELTS Help, General IELTS Help in your app stores, and you can follow us on Instagram. IELTS underscore AE help and G IELTS help. Uh, make sure to join now on these websites. We've got tons and tons of great information for you. This is our academic IELTS website here with the blue background. Simply click this big red button to join our premium package. Use the discount code I get nine to get a 30% discount. Uh, off the premium course. Same thing with general IELTS. Click that big red button. We're going to be using the website for listening in just a few moments here, everyone. So great time to join. Use that code and you're off to the races. Uh, students, if you have questions, uh, send me an email, adrian at aehelp.com. We've got uh, lots of live classes and uh, by being a subscriber on YouTube uh, or on our Instagram, you can see when these live classes are happening. Right now we've got listening part three and four for everyone. Uh, tomorrow we've got uh, task two, finishing with members, speaking part two, where we actually speak with our students. We've got questions and answers for members where we do a bit more speaking with our members. So it's great to be a member of our channel as well and speaking part three. So check that out. All right, um, what do we got now? We got listening, right? So what are we gonna do? We're gonna talk a bit of strategy. We're gonna listen and answer those questions. And then we're going to review and talk a bit more strategy. So for uh, the listening section, the strategy that I taught you last week is to uh, make sure that you uh, check the topics of parts one, two, three, four during the instruction time. And that's how we know that today we're listening about art and about um, roads, everyone. So uh, that's what we're going to do. And um, this is coming from our sixth exam, today's listening test. So uh, you can see we're in section three. In fact, uh, now they call this part three, okay? And uh, when you're looking at um, the questions in part three and you have a little bit of time to review, uh, you see multiple choice questions like this one, then uh, the questions, the first strategy I'm going to teach you here is change questions into statements in your mind, okay? So strategy one, uh, change, let's take that off, so change multiple choice uh, questions into uh, statements. Uh, to hear the answer better. OK, 
okay? So what do I mean? I mean like when you see a question and you're reviewing the questions in IELTS, they will give you some time to review these questions. And when you see a question like how many books has the guest written, in your mind you should immediately uh, think, okay, they're going to say something like, uh, this guest, this one here, uh, this guest has written a certain number of books. Okay, so you want to think about it like that. Um, here it says, what description does the guest give his book? Um, so you will hear something like, my book is, okay? So think about the way you will hear the information, right? That is my first tip for these multiple choice questions. Um, don't necessarily stare at the answers, especially when they get really long like this, okay? The author creates the artwork's meaning, but instead take some notes, okay? So strategy two, uh, use logic and take notes for multiple choice questions. And I'm going to show you how uh, when we do the listening, okay? So I'm going to take notes uh, while we're listening so you can kind of see what I mean by this, okay? So keep these two strategies in mind with multiple choice questions for the listening exam. Strategy one, change questions into statements in your mind to hear the answer better because they, they won't come as questions in the listening. And use logic and take notes for your multiple choice questions, okay? That's what's important. All right, everybody. So let's uh, jump back to our uh, website. Uh, we're going to use, well, we could use either one. We could use the uh, general one as well. Um, yeah, let's use the general IELTS one today. We never do that, and might as well. Listening is the same for academic and for general. So you go to your uh, My Student account, and then when you're in your My Student account, you have all these goodies like uh, computer-based practice exams, full online course, and there's tons of information and help uh, in each of these uh, tool sets. Um, right now, we're going for the uh, IELTS Audio CDs, and this is going to be CD uh, six, because it's the sixth exam and it's going to be um, track number three. Now, uh, students, while you're listening, answer the questions, but don't put the answers in the chat. It gives a chance for everybody to answer on their own, and then, of course, they're not confused by wrong answers, okay? So, so let's do this together, okay? And uh, listen answer questions, and then we'll go through the questions together, all right, afterwards. So here we go, everybody. Let's listen, let's answer, and watch how I take notes for multiple choice questions. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening section three. You will hear a radio host and his guest discussing the virtues of various art forms. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. All right, welcome back everyone. Our next guest is the curator of a major art gallery in the city who has just released his second book on the virtues of art. We're pleased to have Mr. Edgar Patterson here today. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here, and please call me Edgar. Edgar, of course. Now, in your first book, published four years ago, you focused on performance artwork such as plays, musical concerts, films, and other such works. Your second book is a little closer to home for you. It concerns purely creative fine art. Well, yes. It deals with the aesthetic virtue of different painting styles. Okay, so give our viewers a quick rundown on what your book is about. Does it make an argument? 
I mean, does your book take a position on a certain issue in the world of art? Yes, my book does take a position and a rather radical one. The main thesis of my book is that the meaning we associate with a painting exists purely within ourselves. This is in stark contrast to many commentators who believe that the author of a painting gives the painting its meaning. Under this framework, if an artist intends his painting to represent the fear of an orphan child, then this is the one and only meaning such a painting can have. We might call this the intention theory of art. Conversely, my theory is that no matter what the intention of the author is, the meaning of the painting comes from the viewer. The meaning is exactly what the viewer thinks it is. This solves an important problem with the intention theory of art, namely that we do not have access to the mind of the artist, and therefore we do not have access to the painting's meaning at all. Very interesting, Edgar. But doesn't the intention theory work as a sort of grounding for artistic analysis? What I mean is, while we might not know the meaning the artist intended, isn't the point of art to try to discern this meaning? If art is just whatever we want it to be, or feel it as, doesn't that somehow make it less valuable? That's an astute critique of my position, but one I have an answer for. My response is that art is not merely what we want it to be or feel it as. We can still participate in our critique and interpretation. All I want to say is, in the end, it is up to us to discern the meaning and value of paintings on our own. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. Now, let's talk about one type of controversial art, abstract art. How does your, can I call it a subjective theory of meaning? Yes, that is fair. Okay. How does your subjective theory of meaning apply to something like modern or abstract art? Art which doesn't tell an obvious story or have a clear meaning. Many people think that such works of art have no meaning at all. It's certainly an interesting case, but one which my theory is well matched to deal with. You see, abstract art has its critics. Like you say, they think it has no meaning at all. However, other people think abstract works of art have all sorts of meanings. Now, under the intention theory, most of these commentators will be wrong, since the work of art either has a meaning or it doesn't. And if it does, then it only has a single meaning so under the intention theory, only those critics who discern the specific meaning of the artist will be successful. My theory, however, results in each critic being correct in their own way. For example, if, after critically analysing a certain abstract work of art, I determine it is meaningless, then it is meaningless. Because the meaning of an artwork comes from within, I cannot be wrong, and neither can other people. The critic who sees a metaphor for suffering and the critic who views it as something entirely different are both right. We are all correct in our interpretation, as long as we give given the painting a fair critique. What do you mean by a fair critique? Well, I mean it is not enough to merely look at a painting and write it off immediately as meaningless. One must go through a certain process. That said, there are certainly other... That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Right, students so hopefully you've checked your answers I just stopped the audio on the website here so we don't get into part four just yet but we will in a moment um, and then uh, here we've answered hopefully all the questions now 
Of course, I was guiding you here, so hopefully you've done a good job. It was a bit of a challenging um, uh, listening part. Uh, section three can be a little bit challenging like that, okay? And again, uh, notice how I was taking some notes, okay? So for the multiple choice, I was listening, taking some notes, and I was really paying attention uh, to that kind of paraphrasing, if you will, that I did uh, at the beginning while I was reviewing these questions. So for 21, I heard the, um, the speaker uh, or the interviewer actually say second book. And then she describes it. She says it's your first book that you wrote four years ago. And then in your second book, it's much closer to home, meaning it's much more uh, familiar to the speaker. So it's, um, it's the second book. It's about creative art. Um, so here, the answer to 21 and me, uh, Yan and Saeed agree here that uh, it's going to be uh, B too. Uh, now, if uh, everybody wants to kind of share their answers and you're not able to join the chat, remember everyone, you have to subscribe. Uh, again, you have to subscribe to join this chat, okay? So here, um, the question is posed, what description does the guest give his book's thesis? And so again, we paraphrase this when we're reviewing with kind of the idea of like, my book gives this thesis. And then you hear, you know, hopefully you understand the word thesis, okay? Um, if you don't, you should learn this word, okay? So thesis means uh, an, ac an academic argument which can be uh, proven through empirical uh, empirical facts. Okay, so that's what a thesis is. So um, a thesis uh, is kind of the same as uh, a position or an argument. And the man says that his book has kind of a radical uh, position. Does everybody know what radical position actually means? So if I say, you know, I'm taking a radical position and unfortunately or fortunately, we have a lot of radical uh, positions uh, in society today when it comes to economics and health and government. Um, so this is a, an interesting and useful term that you might actually hear in your daily life. Um, radical position what does that mean? Okay. So the answer here, if you're thinking about the answer, should be B. It's a radical theory or a radical thesis. Okay. 22 is not A. 22 is B. Uh, position just means thesis. So um, that would not be right. And that's what I said is use logic as well, right? So this is B. Uh, what is a radical position? If um, you're guessing A, it probably also means that you do not understand the word radical and radical position. Romaine says it's unbalanced. It's not necessarily unbalanced in this case. That's not what they're referring to, Romaine. Cass says maybe something like complicated. Um, yeah, a little bit. Not 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 exactly though, Cass. So radical. Um, yeah, so for us says it's an extreme. It's a novel and extreme position. So it means it's novel and it's extreme. So novel meaning new, of course, right? So when you're a radicalist, it means you're an extremist, okay? So if you have radical ideas, it means you have extreme ideas that are probably quite new and uh, cause great change, okay? Yeah, and Karina says radical can also allude to being controversial. Very good, yeah, absolutely. Um, radical also implies controversial controversial means people disagree on it ok 
Okay. And if you think about this, um, he talks about two kinds of theories of art. One is the intention theory of art. And then the other one, um, it gets named here, is the subjective meaning theory. Okay. And uh, in the intention theory, what's the difference? So as long as you understood these two, you're probably doing okay. So what is, um, what is the intention theory? Okay, so hopefully you understood this from this conversation. Okay, it was quite important. And the other one was the subjective uh, theory or subjective meaning theory of art. And this is what they basically talked about are these two theories, right? Um, the first one is the accepted one. And the second one is uh, the one that's kind of new, that's by this author. The intention theory, hopefully you're all coming up with the same idea, is the artist gives meaning to uh, the painting. Okay, so if you do like, um, I don't know, can I do one here? If you do like a smiley face, then uh, we can say, okay, Adrian just uh, drew a smiley face. Okay. Um, subjective theory of art means that the viewer gives meaning to the painting or the art. Okay, so that would be something like, uh, let's say I do something like that again. Right? And you say it's not a smiley face. Um, it's actually um, two eggs uh, in a frying pan from bird's eye view. Okay. <laughs> I just came up with that, but sure, we can go with that one. Um, so uh, who's right, who's wrong? That's the question uh, that we're going with here, okay? All right, um, so this is, uh, this is what's meant by the intention theory uh, versus the subjective theory of art, okay? So if you understood that, you're doing much better. And it is important when you're doing the IELTS listening to try to understand the main point of the conversation. Okay, so here, uh, which statement best describes the intention theory of art? The intention theory of art is, and then I took some notes here. I wrote down the author gives the meaning to art. Um, so A, the author creates an artwork's meaning looks correct comes from the viewer, no, that would be the other one, there's no meaning, no, right? So 23 is A, very good me, very good Cass. Hopefully everybody got that. I'm not sure why you're drooling, Lynn. It's, is it delicious? I don't know. Um, Saeed says A, Amra agrees. Okay, uh, number 24, what is the biggest problem with the intention theory? And so here I kind of thought of it as, okay, well they're going to say something like one big problem with intention theory is that um, we do not have access to the mind of the artist. That's what the person says. Okay, so I was taking notes there as well. So we've got another A, very good. I see lots of students are like, yeah, that was A again, and it is A, okay. Um, when you see a word like intention, you should think of the other word forms to help you understand it, like intend intentional okay so think of the other word forms intend intentional and so on all right um so next question write no more than two words and or a number for each answer okay uh, number 25 according to the host one of the main goals in art critique is to understand a painting's something. Um, and again, I took some notes here, but I think this one, you could just write the answer as you're reading. Said says it's to understand a painting's 
meaning. Yeah, Cass says meaning, I guessed it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, you hear that word come up again and again. IELTS is, is not meant to be rocket science. So when you hear the same word being repeated several times, it's going to be the right answer. So just Karan says meaning and so on. Okay, um, number 26, the guest responds that art is not something what we want it to be but that we must also participate in critique and interpretation. And I was able to catch the uh, speaker say merely what we want. It is up to us to decide. Okay, so Bharat says the word here is merely. Yeah. Okay, so merely. It's not just what we want it to be. Merely means just, everyone. Okay, so not only or just. Those are synonyms, okay? All right, um, so far so good. Okay, here we had uh, the next half of listening section three or listening part three. Uh, we had the situation, so the context, and then we had the intention theory, and we had the subjective meaning theory. So this is the author gives the meaning, this is the viewer gives the meaning. Situation, critic thinks critically about an artwork and judges it to have no meaning. Number 27, it has to be either right or wrong. So the good news here, everybody, is you've got a 50-50, right? Uh, right or wrong. Uh, if you're guessing, hopefully uh, you get it right, okay? So Saeed says um, they are wrong. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, because according to the author, um, or according to artists, there's always meaning in art. Uh, so this one was kind of a give me. Um, it's wrong. Okay, critic does not, and I highlighted not. You got to be careful about these uh, negatives. Okay. So critic does not think critically about an artwork and judges it to have no meaning. Intention theory says the critic is wrong. Subjective meaning theory says for number uh, 28, Said says right. It's wrong. Right is wrong, wrong is wrong. Uh, no, right is wrong, wrong is right. Um, <clears throat> right is wrong, wrong is right. Uh, wrong is right um, because they, they do not think critically, okay? You can't just look at a piece of artwork for two seconds and say, oh, there's no meaning in that. Um, you have to look at it for, you know, a minute, or two minutes. So it's wrong. 28 is wrong, okay? Cass says, I'm wrong. <laughs> All right. I'm getting confused. Um, no, yeah, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> Um, all right, critic understands the author's meaning. Um, critic is, according to the intention theory, 29. That's right, me. It's right. Yeah, if you understand the author's meaning, right? Like, uh, if uh, I have a smiley face here, and then you're like, yeah, okay, uh, Adrian uh, drew a smiley face, then you correctly understand it. So that's 29. So 29 is right. Okay, uh, number 30. This is what's called an inference type question on the IELTS exam, all right? And again, viewers, if you're watching and you want to join the chat and give your own opinion, uh, you need to subscribe to our channel for this class. Um, so question 30. An art critic is viewing a painting for the first time time and wants to critique it using the subjective meaning theory. That means they don't know the artist. Maybe the artist lived a long time ago and they want to figure out, can I understand this or what's going on? Um, so determine whether the, uh, the critic has satisfied the constraints of the theory with this regard of the critique of the painting or, or not. So uh, write the correct letter, okay? And then here is actual number 30. It's like a really long question, right? You have to visualize this. Um, the critic looks at the painting for a moment 
and concludes from his initial impression that the painting lacks aesthetic value. It's like looking at this smiley face that I have up here and being like, right up above my head, there. Um, and being like, eh, it's not beautiful. But I'm like, what do you, what do you, that is, it is beautiful. It's kind of cute, right? It's like 10th generation emoji. Um, so if you're looking at it for just a second and saying that it's not beautiful, uh, it's probably not fair, right? And concludes from his initial impression, initial means first impression, that the painting lacks aesthetic value. A, the critic has satisfied the demands of the theory, or B, the critic has not satisfied the demands of the theory. The correct answer here is, and this is a thinking question, students, in both the reading and in the listening sections of IELTS, there are going to be a couple of questions that um, need you to think about the content to figure out the answer. And the correct answer here is B, the critic has not satisfied the demands of the theory because the author says that uh, in this theory, for it to make sense, you have to give it some effort. You have to give some energy to try to understand the, uh, the meaning, right? So B is the answer, Snoop, with uh, Pikachu uh, avatar, okay? All right, um, so B is the correct answer. The critic has not said, you have to you have to give it attention. Okay, uh, we're on to section four, everybody. Count up your scores, let's jump to section four. Now section four, careful, there's no pausing. It's all 10 answers coming in one smooth lecture, okay? And again, we're going to listen and answer section four. I'm going to hop back to our General IELTS website this time. Here we go. And start section four. Students, don't put the answers in the chat. We'll go over the answers together after. Again, uh, if you want to join the chat, subscribe uh, to the channel and you can start chatting right away. Okay. All right. Um, so here we go with uh, section four. Everybody's ready. Now turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a lecture about road infrastructure and its connection to economic prosperity. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Roads have been connected to economic prosperity for millennia. The first roads were thought to have been created by repeated animal grazing and then utilized by humans as ready-made routes for travel between adjacent lands. These roads, evidence for which exists going back 12,000 years, were likely not connected so much to economic prosperity as to survival itself. These roads allowed hunter-gatherers faster access to greater swaths of land. The first paved roads were used in ancient Egypt about 4,500 years ago. Historians theorize that these roads were the first roads used for trade in our history. These roads also would have been used to transport items, such as building supplies. Though rivers were much more practical thoroughfares for the transport of goods, certain goods, from certain areas, could not be transported by boat, and this necessitated the creation of roads for economic reasons. The Silk Road, though not precisely a road, is one of the most famous trade routes in history. Composed of many types of road, the Silk Road stretched from China and Thailand in the east all the way through the Middle East and terminating in Western Europe. 
These different routes of the Silk Road brought myriad items from the east to the west, including, of course, silk. This brought economic prosperity to China and surrounding regions for many centuries. The Silk Road was so valuable for commerce that it persisted for over 1500 years. The Roman Empire was the first major manufacturer of a system of roads. At its height, the Roman Empire contained 29 major roads, totaling over 75,000 kilometers. That's enough road to go around the world twice. Notably, this is almost the precise total length of the modern United States interstate highway system. These roads connected the vast lands of the empire and brought an intertwined economic prosperity to the diverse regions of the empire. Furthermore, the roads were used for military transportation, giving the Romans a massive strategic advantage over their less advanced adversaries. Through the Middle Ages, roads continued to be built and used for trade and commerce, though technological advances were virtually non-existent. Though tar-based roads were used briefly in the Arab Empire in the 8th century, this technology would not take off for another millennium. Today our roads and highways connect our communities, countries and economies. They are the modern trade routes by which we are all connected to each other. The modern world would not be possible without the vast expanse of road infrastructure. One interesting development in the history of road infrastructure was the advent of underground systems. The first such system, the London Underground, opened in 1863. Such subterranean routes greatly increase the volume of human life that a city can sustain, thus increasing that city's economic output. London would not be a fraction of the economic powerhouse it is today without its underground rail system. The same can be said for virtually every other major economic centre. Underground systems are the next generation of economic generators. While roads move goods which create economic prosperity, underground systems move human capital which creates further economic prosperity. What is the next great advance in ground transportation? Some futurists have theorised about a system of tubes propelled by air pressure or other means which would transport individuals vast distances in short times. Such a system could move humans at unprecedented speeds, perhaps with an economic footprint far less than that of subterranean networks. Such tubes could even be built underwater Imagine such a system connecting New York to London or Tokyo to San Francisco. It would be incredible. Whatever lies ahead for humanity, roads have gotten us to where we are and they are very likely to play a prominent role in getting us to where we will be next, in one form or another. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, um, so again, let me just hop back to the website here and uh, stop the audio for that listening section. Okay, um, so roads, yeah. The evolution of roads for humanity started somewhere. Uh, let's see where. So uh, this professor is talking about roads maybe a, in a human geography class i can't remember what they said at the beginning but um the first question uh, it comes very quickly at the beginning what phenomenon created the first roads um there's a very clear answer he emphasized this answer um what was it Said says animal gracing yeah it's close Said. the the word is animal grazing uh, and if you go hiking in the forest, you can still see that. You can see animal paths and uh, it's animal grazing and it's easier to walk on those paths than through the thick forest. So animal grazing created the first uh, roads, right? Animals moving through the land and eating the vegetation, cutting a road through the vegetation. And of course, with their feet, they're stomping a path as well. Their hooves 
oftentimes, right? So animal grazing created the first roads. That answer came very quickly, and then you had to wait about a minute or so before the next answer came. The roads were necessary for the transportation of many goods. Uh, what was a much more practical thoroughfare? Thoroughfare means transportation route. Uh, for the transport of goods in ancient times, this was given very, very clearly. He says it in two ways. The correct word is rivers. Um, rivers, countable, so with plural. Okay, uh, Rivers was the correct answer there. Animal grazing and rivers. Okay, um, and then we went on to uh, which of these roads totaled approximately 75,000 kilometers? I was paying attention to this number here, the 75,000 uh, kilometers, and then as it was mentioned, so A means one and three, B is all of them, and C is one, three, and uh, five. So the correct answer here is A. Um, it was only referred to for the Roman road network and the uh, United States interstate. Uh, they don't actually tell you how long the Silk Road is. We don't know based on this audio, okay? It's not given. So here A was the correct answer. Okay, uh, what were the two benefits of the Roman road, uh, Roman system of roads? Um, here I wrote down that it was military and economic. So economic prosperity for the city of Rome, uh, not the city of Rome, the empire of Rome. Uh, increased mobility of Roman armies, that definitely sounds like military. Rapid technological advances, it did not talk about that. The importance of luxury goods from China, mm, that's probably not the Roman system of roads, even if there is something there. And E, broad economic prosperity for the empire. Yeah, so they could bring, you know, different kinds of food and items from around Rome. So uh, broad economic. So the correct answers here were B and E, Rashika, Diana, good job. All right, okay, uh, be really careful with weird little, I mean, I don't, I don't much like that IELTS does this, but they have to make sure that um, people are paying attention. So uh, A is wrong because it's not the city of Rome, it's the empire of Rome, right? The Roman Empire. So B and E were the correct answers. Okay, and then here we had this interesting one. This is um, like if you're doing the computer-based exam, you're probably doing drag and drop here. So you had ancient roads, okay? And then you had subway systems. You had future transportation. Basically A, B, and C, ancient, subway, future, and all of the above. So let's see. Uh, number 36, increases economic activity. Is it only ancient roads? Is it subway systems? And how about future transportation? Will that do it as well? Are they all of them or is it just one of them? Um, Said says 36 should be B, applies to subway systems. Said, keep your thoughts simple. Remember, it says here for this one that ancient roads, like in Rome, also brought economic prosperity. So we heard about the economy for both ancient roads and for subway systems so we can uh, make a very good inference that the correct answer here is going to be D. Okay, so D, D is the right answer there. Um, responsible for the growth of modern cities. Okay. Um, future transportation would not make sense for that. So here the correct answer is B. Okay, subway systems, big modern cities, New York, Tokyo, London, subway system. Uh, used for military transportation. Uh, do we use subways for military transport? Eh, not so much, right? Future, 
Eh, probably not so much. Um, a, ancient roads. In the ancient times, the military moved on the roads. Uh, these days, uh, yeah, maybe the roads, but not the subways. So it'd be a bad idea for the military to use the subway. Um, moves human capital. Hopefully you got that. Should be B again. People get on subways. Uh, ancient roads, future transportation. Best answer, D. All of those will move humans, right? Okay, so number 39, D. You have to think carefully. That first subways, yeah, they move people. Ancient roads, they move humans? Yeah, they move Future, yeah, they'll move humans. All of them. Okay, number 40, that was an easy one, okay. Will, as long as you paid attention to will, it means the future, so uh, that would be C. Okay, so will move humans at unprecedented speed. So D, B, A, D, and uh, C are the correct answers here. All right, students, uh, hopefully you got that and hopefully you picked up some strategies there. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, what did you get from uh, 40? So if you were here last week and you did part one uh, to uh, part four for exam six, then you should have a score out of 40. And you know, you can check your band score on the website again. If you go to our general IELTS website um, here and you go to the very bottom of the page, um, just like down, no other side, well, where is it, down, uh, can I twist my, okay, yeah, down, uh, there, <laughs> no, there. <laughs> I can't work. I, I would never be a Da Vinci. I can't write in a mirror. Okay, so down there. Down there, um, you see those uh, like home IELTS course and there's a score calculator. Let me make that bigger. See, score calculator right there. Um, you have a score calculator and you can pop in your score. Okay, so if you have 36 like Lynn, um, then you get a band eight. It's right above my head. Band eight. Okay. Uh, Bakrat, if you got 15 out of 20, that's not bad. Let's say you would have gotten something like 32 total or 33. That would be a band 7.5, 32, 7.5. Uh, Cass got 35. Cass, 35 is a band 8. That's pretty good. Okay. Diana, 36. That's pretty good. Ming Kui, Yun, 31. It's band 7. Okay. One more, had you had you gotten one more Minkia, you would have gotten 7.5, okay? Lei Kuang Hui got 25, band six, okay? All right, so uh, you can check that on our websites. And again, remember students, um, if you really like our videos and are, you wanna get all of our practice exams and tons more help, uh, join the full course, click that red button uh, in Canada, it costs $74, but for example, like in Vietnam, um, it only costs, I think, about $30. And then you can actually use, that's huge, um, you can actually use a discount code here. See that coupon code above my head? Uh, so you can use a discount code um, that we have right now. It's I get nine, um, and then you get 30% off of uh, the premium package. And see, now if you're in Canada, it's only $52. If you're in Vietnam, I think it's only like, $25 or something like that or not well US it's actually cheaper it's like because this is Canadian dollars um, but US dollars I think it's only like $18 for everything in Vietnam and India um, so check that out everybody uh, for academic outs go here it's aehelp.com click that big red button oh and it's a one-time payment it's not like we want to charge you every month it's the IELTS exam it's not your Netflix subscription so um, it's a one-time payment and it's for uh, lifetime access. Uh, Lin says it's 22 uh, in Vietnam, 22 Vietnamese currency. Okay, um, cool, everybody. So that's it for this listening class and um, for today's live lessons, but uh, hopefully you will come back tomorrow. Tomorrow uh, we're going to have speaking uh, part two for uh, members. 
or sorry, um, we're going to finish task two uh, with members and we're going to have speaking part two for everyone. So that's tomorrow's two live classes. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can always write me, adrian at aehelp.com. Okay. And um, yeah, I hope everybody has an awesome rest of their day. I hope you all enjoy whatever life brings you at this very moment and you stay strong and healthy and optimistic. Much love to all of you, wherever you are on this beautiful blue planet. I'm Adrian, signing out from Victoria, Canada for now. Bye everyone.